Dear friends, welcome to Enquest. Under this program, we are starting one more initiative that is titled as Videos on Important Topics. So under this program, today we are presenting our very first video about genetically modified crops. So that is in short called as GM crops as well. These videos are useful for your UPSC, KPSC and all other competitive exams. So let's see the content of today's discussion. Number one, what is genetically modified crop? Now, what are all the advantages of the same? What is the legal position of genetically modified crops in India? Different methods of obtaining GM crops and types of different modifications, then cultivation of GM crops in India, and finally, challenges of GM crops. So with this, let us understand the meaning of genetic modification. To understand that, I have taken the example of orange tree here. So tree number one and here I have taken tree number two. So there is a slight difference between both the trees. Tree number one produces less yield, but the fruits are very tasty. But tree number one produces more yield, but the fruits are not that tasty. Now, what are the desired characters here? One, yield is our interest. At the same time, fruits also should be tasty. Now, what we can do here to get this combination? We can go to the molecular level of tree, level, tree number one. That means we can isolate the DNA of the same. And in the DNA, we need to identify the gene that actually codes for taste. And this gene actually will be inserted in the DNA of the tree number two. Now, this is called as genetic modification. We are inserting gene from one you know, particular tree to other tree. For an example, now the trees that are going to be obtained here will produce fruits that will be of great yield at the same time fruits will be tasty. So this kind of a modification in simple words is called as genetic modification. So as I told you before, we're going to do experiments at the molecular level. Now, what is our interest? Our interest is gene of a particular character. Now, what do you mean by a gene? So let us start from the macro level. So I have taken an example of a plant here. Plants will have leaves. Leaves will ha have uh, millions of cells. Each cell will have its own nucleus. Each nucleus will have a chromosome and chromosome is uh, you know, made of uh, DNA and DNA will have number of genes. These genes will actually code for a particular character. And we need to isolate the gene that is of our interest to code for a particular character. So this kind of an experiment is called as genetic modification of crops. So now let us understand this with more scientific terms. So genetically modified crops are plants used in agriculture, the DNA of which has been modified using genetic engineering methods. So as I told you, so we're going to basically modify DNA and this modification will be done by using various genetic engineering methods. And in most cases, the aim is to introduce a new trait to the plant, which does not occur naturally in the species. So Trait is nothing but a character. In simple words, trait is nothing but a special character. So we are trying to insert a special character which is not there naturally in that particular DNA. So this kind of a modification is called as genetic modification. And now what is the purpose of doing this genetic modification in case of plants? Actually to increase resistance of plants towards certain pests. So as we all know, the plants are very susceptible to pests. So we can give them the resistance towards, uh, you know, such pests, even the diseases, and uh, we can make them resistant towards environmental conditions. And we can also reduce the spoilage and we can increase the resistance towards chemical treatment, for example, treatment with respect to herbicides or improving the nutrition profile of the crops as well. So these are the various purposes for, for which we actually do genetic modification. And they are not just used in uh, crops production. You know, genetic modification or genetically modified procedure is also used in non-food crops as well. For example, production of pharmaceutical agents, even in biofuels, and other industrially useful goods as well as bioremediation. So these are the, all the other areas where actually we use genetically modified varieties. And genetically modified crops have numerous benefits for human health and environment. So let's see with respect to the statistics. Genetically modified technology adoption had reduced 
chemical pesticide used by 37% so use of pesticides is definitely harmful to consumption so that use of uh, pesticides has been reduced to an extent of 37% and it increases uh, crop yields by 22% and increased farmer profit by 68% so it reduces pesticides use and it is going to increase the yield at the same time it is going to increase the profit of the farmers not that just that so this reduction in pesticide use has been ecologically beneficial but benefits may be reduced by overuse so if we overuse the same so these benefits are going to be you know vanished and pesticide poisoning were uh, reduced by up to 9 million cases per year in india alone so we had lot of cases with respect to use of pesticides and that number of pesticide related issues have come down to up to 9 million cases per year just in india alone and widespread introduction of bt cotton led to 25% decline in farmer suicides in india so this is a great uh, change because uh, you know one of the major reasons why uh, the deaths happen in india is uh, uh, in terms of farmer suicides so due to introduction of bt cotton the farmer suicides have been uh, reduced by 25% and bt maize uh, led uh, to reduction of cancer rates caused by mycotoxins and not just this and it has uh, various other advantages like uh, enhanced taste and quality in crops and uh, reduced maturation time so we need not wait for a long time to get the crops in our hand so it can be you know available in a shorter span and new products and growing techniques can be involved by using uh, genetically modified crops now you know uh, we need to take a statement of norman borlong at this uh, you know point in time so norman borlong so as we all know is the father of green revolution so he actually supports genetically modified crops because he says that it is better to die eating genetically modified food instead of dying of hunger so as we have seen the uh, global hunger index of many countries is very very poor so this actually helps to increase the yield so it is better to die of uh, eating genetically modified food instead of dying hunger so this is what is the statement given by norman borlong so there is a scientific consensus that the currently available food derived from the gm crops poses no great danger to human health than the conventional food uh, but that each gm food needs to be tested on case by case basis before introduction so as for the you know consensus by you know scientists they say that these gm crops possess no danger to human health and this cannot be taken as the universal statement just by looking at one crop so each and every time we do such genetic modification every crop has to be studied case by case to prove its safety and efficacy so we cannot go by the generalized statement of achieving success in one of the crops and the legal and regulated regulatory status of gm food varies by country so with some nations banning or restricting them and others uh, permitting them with widely different degrees of regulations so obviously the rules and regulations to grow or use genetically modified crops in uh, you know various country countries will differ from each other so a few countries have actually banned or restricted them a few more countries have uh, permitted with uh, greater degrees of regulation and however uh, uh, you know so far we just have spoken about the advantages but there are opponents as well so people oppose genetically modified crops and they have objected to gm crops on grounds including environmental impacts food safety whether gm crops are needed to address food needs whether they are you know sufficiently accessible to farmers in developing countries and concerns over subjecting crops to intellectual property law so when such modifications are uh, under ipr so it will become very expensive and it cannot reach to the farmers or uh, you know if that has to reach farmers they will have to put a lot of money that might not benefit farmers in developing countries so these are the various challenges and safety concerns led 38 countries including 19 in europe to officially prohibit their cultivation so out of all the countries in the world so 38 countries among which 13 european nations have completely banned you know growing uh, you know genetically modified crops now what is the legal position of genetically modified crops in india in india 
the genetic engineering appraisal committee it is in short called as gac is the apex body that allows for commercial release of genetically modified crops now what is the penalty use of unapproved gm variant so this is penalty this penalty is only if anybody tries to grow unapproved gm variant can attract a jail term of 5 years and fine of up to fine of 1 lakh under the environmental protection act 1986 so with this uh, let's get into the you know scientific details like uh, you know methods of producing gm crops so genetically engineered crops have genes added or removed using genetic engineering techniques originally including gene guns electroporation micro injection and agro bacterium so these were actually conventional methods so as i told you before so if you just extract the dna of any particular crop we may either add the gene or we may also remove the gene so such process is called as genetic modification it's not that always we add the gene sometimes we also remove the gene which is not required so such modification is called as genetic engineering it was done by using gene guns electroporation micro injection and agro bacterium but now we have you know two latest technologies one is called as crispr and talen they offer much more precision and convenient ed editing techniques now let us understand in detail what is crisp r so crisp r is nothing but clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats it is a family of dna sequences found in the genome of prokaryotic organisms such as bacteria and archaea bacteria now what do you mean by prokaryote prokaryotic nothing but these are the primitive organisms wherein the nucleus of the organism is not very well developed so this crispr is related to the family of you know dna sequences they are actually found in the prokaryotes prokaryote uh, prokaryotes are nothing but the bacteria and archaea bacteria so they are you know they have extracted dna from these bacteria and archaea bacteria and they are known to be prokaryotes and contrary to that we have e eukaryotes so eukaryotes have very well developed nucleus but prokaryotes prokaryotes will not have well developed nucleus so these sequences are derived from the dna fragments of the bacteriophages that had previously infected the prokaryote so let us understand what do you mean by bacteriophage see bacteriophage is nothing but it is a virus actually this virus actually infects the bacteria so we are going to extract the dna from this infected bacteria so that is what we say here these sequences sequences are nothing but the dna sequences are derived from dna fragments of the bacteriophage that had previously infected such prokaryotes prokaryotes are nothing but as i told you before bacteria and archaea bacteria now this crisp r are found in approximately 50 percentage of the sequenced bacterial genomes and nearly 90 percentage of the sequenced archaea so you can uh, see the percentage here so this uh, crisp r that is infected by bacteriophage can be found to an extent of 50 percentage in bacterial genomes and 90 percentage in uh, sequenced archaea bacteria and now this crisp r is not alone so it has one more enzyme that is called as case 9 so case 9 is nothing but a protein 9 that is associated with crispr i'll tell you the combination of how you know crispr and case 9 how actually it works in isolating the dna uh, so now, now let's understand about crisp 9 so this is actually an enzyme that uses crisp r sequence as a guide to recognize and cleave specific strand of dna that are complementary to the crisp r sequence so i'll explain everything now so crisp you know case 9 enzyme together with crisp r sequence form the basis of technology known as crisp case 9 that can be used to edit gene within the organism so for example so this is the dna of the you know crop or the organism from which we need to identify or extract the gene so we are going to use the technology of case 9 combined with crispr 
Now, what is the advantage of having case nine and CRISPR together? So these two together will actually identify the specific spot from which the gene has to be, you know, you know, taken away. So this is very very crucial step in uh, you know genetic modification because we need to exactly identify the gene that codes for the special character or a trait. So if we fail uh, in identifying the specific gene and extracting the gene then the entire process will be failure so that is the reason why this crispr and case 9 enzyme together will definitely help us to extract the specific part of the gene that is of our interest and this editing process has wide variety of applications including uh, basic biological research development of biotechnological products and treatment of diseases as well the development of crisp case 9 genome editing technique was recognized by the nobel prize in chemistry in 2020 which was awarded to emmanuel charpentier and jennifer doudna so these two scientists uh, you know have actually developed uh, crisp uh, r case 9 genome editing technique so for that reason they have been awarded nobel in the year 2020 in the area of chemistry now let us understand the other technique that is called as Talon. Now, what is Talon? Talon is nothing but transcription activator like effector nuclease or restriction enzymes that can be engineered to cut specific sequence of DNA. I told you always the challenging part is to cut the specific part of the DNA. Now, what do you mean by nucleases? So, nucleases are restriction enzymes. Now, restriction enzymes are nothing but they actually identify the specific part of the gene in the DNA and they exactly cut there. So that part of the, you know, the, that component is actually called as restriction enzyme or they can be also termed as nucleases. So talon is one of such things. So the full form of that is transcription activator like effector nucleases. And they are made by fusing a TAL. TAL is nothing but transcription activator like effector. They are merged with DNA binding domain to the DNA cleavage domain. So a nuclease which cuts a DNA strand. So I'll explain with this particular picture here. You can closely observe. So this is the double stranded DNA molecule. And this colored uh, you know, uh, things that we have mentioned here on either side of the DNA is called as TAL. So TAL is nothing but transcription activator like effector. So this transcription activator like effector is combined with DNA cleavage domain. So you can see DNA cleavage domain here. So this TAL is going to bind the sequence of DNA on either side. So when it is bind on either side, so it is going to you know, identify the exact location of cutting uh, the gene. And now the role of DNA cleavage comes into picture and it is going to cut the DNA at exact part. So this isolated part of DNA is called as gene. So this gene can be further inserted in the DNA of the crop that we are actually looking for. So this process is called as the cutting of DNA by using talent technique. So transcription activator like effector can be engineered to bind to a, you know, practically any desired DNA sequence. So as I told you, it binds to, you know, any DNA sequence appropriately. So when combined with a nucleus, DNA can cut at a specific location. So this cannot work alone. So this has to be combined with a nucleus. So this nucleus is going to cut the gene or DNA at a specific position. So the restriction enzymes, as I told you, restriction enzymes are those which actually used to cut the DNA can be introduced into the cell. So such talents can be introduced into a cell for use in gene editing for genome editing in situ. In situ is nothing but at that spot. We can cut the DNA at that spot, a technique known as genome editing with the engineered nucleases. So alongside, alongside zinc finger nucleases. So this is one other method. Uh, we studied uh, CRISP case 9 and we also studied Talon. So is a prominent tool in the field of genome editing. So these are right now. So number one, gene uh, zinc finger nucleases, CRISPR case 9 and Talon are prominent tool in the field of you know, genome editing. So I'll just give you a brief uh, you know, uh, summary of uh, zinc fingered nucleases. So nucleases, as I told you, there's a, they are restriction enzymes. They actually cut the DNA. 
zinc finger nucleases are actually proteins so as we all know proteins are made of amino acids so these amino acids are actually bind bound together with the help of zinc and this actually interacts with the dna so same interaction can be used to cut the dna at a specific location so these are the different methods by which we can actually isolate the desired part of the gene in the dna so one is zinc finger nucleases other one is crisp r case 9 and other one is talen so now let us understand the types of modification so what are the different types of modification that we can do in the dna so there are three kinds of modifications number one is called as transgenic plants number two is called as cisgenic plants and number three is called as subgenic plants now let us understand the first one the transgenic plants now what do you mean by transgenic plants so transgenic uh, plants have genes inserted into them that are derived from another species the inserted genes can come from the species within the same kingdom or between kingdoms for example like plant to plant or plant to bacteria so i'll explain you in very simple words so in case of transgenic plants we can isolate the dna from one particular plant within the same species and can be modified like we can uh, you know take from a particular plant and that can be inserted in another plant so this is one way so within the same kingdom or we can also do cross kingdom in the sense we can take the dna from any bacteria and it can be inserted in plant and vice versa so from plant to bacteria so this kind of uh, you know cross modification is also possible or straight modification is also possible so it can be workable between the kingdoms or within the kingdoms and the plant that we are going to obtain after such modification is called as transgenic plants so this is one of the methods by which we can do the modification so let us see a few examples here so transgenic carrots is one of the examples to you know transgenic so these uh, uh, transgenic carrots have been used to produce the drug tally glucoserase alpha which is used to treat gaucher's disease so this is one of the products of uh, you know which is example of transgenic plant so uh, example is uh, carrots so these uh, transgenic carrots are used to produce a drug and this drug is used to treat gaucher's disease gaucher's disease is nothing but kind of uh, you know weakness of bones and the organs will be enlarged in this particular disease and second example is uh, in the laboratory transgenic plants have been modified to increase photosynthesis currently about 2 percentage at most plants versus the theoretical potential of 9 to 10 percentage so these transgenic uh, experimentation also helped in increasing photosynthesis now what is the importance of photosynthesis this increased the food production within the plants now how this modification is done so this is possible by changing the rubisco enzyme so i'll tell you about the rubisco enzyme later so this changing plants from 3 c3 to c4 plants by placing rubisco rubisco is nothing but ribulose 15 biphosphate carboxylase oxygenase in a carboxysome by adding cot co2 pumps in the cell wall or by changing the leaf form or size so let me explain this so this modification is done to actually change plants from c3 to c4 now what is the difference between c3 and c4 c3 will have a stomata so you all would be definitely knowing stomata stomata will be there in mostly in leaves and this c3 plants will have closed stomata so this can be converted into c4 plants and c4 plants will have open stomata so when the stomata is open it actually helps absorbing carbon dioxide when the carbon dioxide is absorbed we know that for photosynthesis we need carbon dioxide so this is how we can actually improve the photosynthetic capacity of plants by converting c3 into c4 so c4 is nothing but a transgenic plant so this is by using rubisco enzyme so rubisco enzyme actually adds co2 pump to the cell wall so we all know that plants will have cell wall the outermost layer to which you know it is going to add co2 pumps so this is by a way increasing the photosynthetic property by changing the leaf form or size so it is either changing the form of the leaf 
are the size of the leaves. So these are the examples of transgenic modifications. Now let us learn about cisgenic modification. Now what is cisgenic plants? So these are made using genes found within the same species or a closely related one where conventional plant breeding can occur. So as I told you in the previous example, so cross breeding was possible like plant to bacteria was possible, but here in cisgenic it is not allowed. So here the cross breeding is not allowed. So the, the modification is done within the same kingdom like plant to plant only or that two within the same species or bacteria to bacteria only. So cross modification is not done. So if cross modification is done, that, that is called as transgenic plant. So if the modification is done within the same species, it is called as cisgenic. So some breeders and scientists argue that cisgenic modification is useful for plants that are difficult to crossbreed by conventional means such as potatoes and that plants in cisgenic category should not require the same regulatory scrutiny as transgenic. Obviously, so when we do transgenic modification, we have taken a gene from some other species and that requires a lot of regulations because we need to study the safety profile of those crops. But cisgenic uh, you know, modification, we have not taken gene from some other species. It is transferring within the same species. So that is why the you know, researchers say that same regulations that are there for, uh, you know, transgenic plants should not be applicable to this because this kind of a modification is just a minimal change, not the maximum change. So with this, let us uh, go to the third category that is called as subgenic modification. Now, the genetically modification of plants can also be developed by using gene knockdown or gene knockout. Now, what is gene knockdown or gene you know, knock down or knock out here. See the previous two methods that we saw there, there was a change in the DNA and the gene is extracted from some other species. So we used to extract the gene from some other species and it was supposed to be introduced in the DNA in the crop that we are interested in. But subgenic, so we don't borrow gene from any other species. Instead of that, we are going to deactivate the gene that is already present in the DNA. I'll tell you the reason why we are supposed to deactivate or make that gene silent. So that process of making gene silent or inactive is called as gene knockdown or gene knockout. So gene knockdown is an experimental procedure to suppress Suppress in the sense reduce or, or silence the expression of a particular gene or genes of an organism to alter the genetic make makeup of a plant without incorporating gene from other plants. So as I told you, we are not borrowing any gene here. Instead of that, the gene that is already present in the, in the parent DNA will be silenced or suppressed. Let's see what is the purpose of doing so. We have an example uh, that dates back to 2014. Chinese researcher Gao Kaxia filed patent on the creation of a strain of wheat that is resistant to powdery mildew. The strain lacks gene that encode proteins that repress defense against the mildew. The researchers deleted all three copies of genes from wheat's exoploid genome. So I'll explain this. So uh, there has been an experiment done on wheat crop in China in the year 2014 and they got patent for the same as well. Now what they have done, so this uh, crop wheat, it was actually you know, susceptible to one of the uh, powdery mildews, uh, you know, powdery mildews, it is uh, supposed to eat the crops. Now the, uh, there was a gene actually that was responsible. This used to produce, this gene used to produce proteins in the same wheat crop. These proteins used to make this crop susceptible for this particular powdery mildew. Now what they did, they actually suppressed this gene. So this gene suppression led to non-production of proteins that was responsible for making this wheat, you know, susceptible to powdery mildew. Now there are, uh, there is no more production of that proteins that makes this crop susceptible to powdery mildew. Now this has, uh, you know, developed resistance for powdery mildew. So this kind of a conversion is called as subgenic. So for this research, they also have patent for the same. And one more, uh, you know, the technology that they've actually used, Gao used the talents and CRISPR gene editing tools without adding or changing any other genes. 
The CRISPR technique has also been used by Penn State uh, researcher Young, Young to modify white burden mushrooms uh, that is uh, scientifically called as agaricus, uh, you know, bisporus to be non-browning. So similar kind of uh, gene modification was done by some other team of researchers to convert, you know, to retain white button mushrooms to avoid these mushrooms to getting converted into brownish. So these are the techniques that they are actually used without adding any additional gene they have actually silenced the gene that is already within the same DNA. So those kind of crops are called as subgenic crops. So with this, uh, let us understand cultivation of GM crops in India. So BT cotton is the only genetically modified crop that has been approved for commercial cultivation in 2002 by the government of India. So BT cotton was approved to grow in India in the year 2002 by the government of India. So long-term studies were conducted by ICAR. So before uh, giving approval, so long-term studies were conducted by Indian Council of Agricultural Research on the impact of Bt cotton, which did not show any adverse effects on soil, microflora, and animal health. So after confirming that they do not produce any problem to the soil, microflora and animal health growing of Bt cotton was approved in the year 2002. However, there is an op opposition as always. However, the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Science and Technology and uh, Environment and Forest in its report on genetically modified crops and its impacts on environment submitted to a parliament on August 25, 2017 recommended that GM crops should be introduced in the country only after critical scientific evolution of its benefits and safety and also recommended restructuring of regulatory framework for unbiased assessment of GM crops. So though approval was given, so the parliamentary standing committee uh, actually advised uh, to have critical examination before giving approval and also reframe the regulatory structure to have better regulations on uh, GM crops. So in 2002, approval for the commercial release of BT cotton hybrid or varieties resistant to cotton ball worm was given. So this crop, the speciality of this BT cotton, so it was made resistant to one particular worms that is called as ball worms. So this uh, resistance actually improves the yield of the cotton. And now the other crop that we need to talk here is uh, BT brinjal. So this BT brinjal uh, resistant to brinjal shoot fly developed by Mahiko in collaboration with University of Agricultural Sciences Darwad, Tamil Nadu Agricultural University Coimbatore and ICAR Indian Institute of Vegetable Research Varanasi was approved by Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee in the year 2009. But due to 10 years moratorium imposed by genetically modified crops by the Technical Expert Committee appointed by the Honorable Supreme Court of India, no further action on commercialization has been taken. So the Technical Expert Committee on the guidelines or orders of Supreme Court of India, they actually you know, uh, uh, announced the moratorium for 10 uh, years. Moratorium in the sense, same status quo was supposed to maintain for 10 years. Though uh, there is another variety like uh, BT brinjal. So this genetically modification actually helps in uh, making this brinjal that is resistant to shoot fly. Like how uh, the cotton was resistant to bowl worm, this brinjal was made resistant to shoot fly. Obviously the yield of the crop uh, you know, will increase. But the problem is due to moratorium that is imposed by the technical expert committee, no further action on commercialization of BT, BT Benjol was taken in India. And uh, recently, uh, there is a kind of an update with respect to this uh, here. Recently, the Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee and uh, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change Government of India has again allowed biosafety research. So it is not commercialization, it is only to engage biosafety research field trials for two new transgenic varieties of indigenously developed BT brinjal in eight states. And you know now what do you mean by transgenic varieties. So for research purpose only, there has been approval given during 2022, 20, 
2023 in eight states on two different varieties of indigenously developed BT brinjal only after taking non no objection certificate that is NOC from states concerned and confirmation of availability of isolated stretch of land for this purpose. So you cannot disturb the you know regular uh, cultivation. So that is the reason why they have taken NOC from the states uh, uh, that are concerning about this particular thing, and they have taken a land a stretch of land for this particular purpose only. So now the research is again started. And this research will go between uh, 2020 and 2023 for the development of BT brinjal of indigenously developed transgenic you know, crops. Uh, these indigenous uh, transgenic varieties of brinjal hybrids, namely, so they are actually named as Janak and other one is named as BSS uh, 793 containing BT Cry1 FA1 gene event 142 have been developed by the National Institute for Plant Biotechnology, Indian Council of Agricultural Research. So the name of the gene that uh, they actually modified or introduced is called as CRY1 FA1 gene. So these are the certain kind of codes they actually give for the genes. And it has been developed by NIPB, uh, that is National Institute for Plant Biotechnology and Indian Council of Agricultural Research. And next uh, genetically modified crop is uh, genetically modified mustard. So that is Dara mustard hybrid 11 that is also called as DMH11. So this was actually developed by Delhi University is pending for commercial release as GEAC that is Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee has advised to generate complete safety assessment data on environmental biosafety, especially effects on beneficial insect species. So since we kind of make these, uh, you know, this mustard resistant to certain insects, it should not also kill the insects which are beneficial to us. So that is the reason why, you know, the GAE, uh, you know, GEAC, that is Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee has advised to generate complete safety assessment data before it has been, it is going to be commercialized in India. So ICAR, that is Indian Council of Agricultural Research, always promotes the science-based innovative technology, including research on GM crops. So network project on transgenic in crops, presently network project on functional genomics and genetic modification in crops was launched by ICAR in 2005 for development of GM crops in case of, you know, uh, pigeon pea, chickpea, sorghum, potato, brinjal, tomato, banana for different traits and uh, material is in different stages of development. So there are a lot of experiments that are going on in India on all these crops and all these uh, process of genetical modification is under different stages of development because this ICAR actually promotes such, uh, you know, innovation as like uh, what we have been seeing in genetically modified crops. Now, the next uh, crop that we are supposed to talk is called as golden rice. So the scientific name of golden rice is Oriza sativa. The Institute, International Rice Research Institute, that is in short called as IRRI, and its partners, that is uh, the Philippines Rice Research Institute and Bangladesh Rice Research Institute, have successfully cultivated golden rice in a controlled environment on IRRI, that is International Rice Research Institute campus. Now, what is this golden rice? Golden rice is actually genetified, you know, genetically modified to introduce an enzyme. So this enzyme helps in production of vitamin A. So as we all uh, know that uh, rice is low on nutritional profile. So it is good that we add some uh, nutritional value to it. So this was actually done by genetically modifying it to introduce the production of vitamin A. So this introduction actually made the rice look uh, kind of uh, golden color. So that is the reason why it was titled as golden rice. So the safety evolutions have shown that golden rice is as safe and nutritious as conventional rice, but comes with the added benefit of increased beta carotene 
content in the grain. So this beta carotene, as I told you, this actually helps in production of vitamin A. So this is aimed at uh, covering a vast rice eating population in the world with high prevalence of deficiencies as we know that. So to avoid deficiencies, and we also know that vast uh, variety, you know, vast uh, population across the globe actually, uh, you know, eats rice as one of their staple foods. And golden rice is a new type of rice that contains beta carotene that is pro-vitamin A, which is converted into vitamin A as needed by the body and gives the grain its golden color. And research has indicated that one cup of golden rice can provide up to 50 percentage of daily requirement of an adult for vitamin A. Just one cup of you know, golden rice will be, you know, sufficing 50 percentage of vitamin A needs in an adult. But presently, it has low shelf life of not more than three months as it may lose its uh, nutri nutrients after that. So if you store uh, this golden rice for uh, three months, it is uh, found that uh, the nutritional value, that is vitamin A value is going to be lost. So that is the problem. So that's called as low shelf life. So Golden rice can be grown just like ordinary rice and varieties containing the GR2E golden rice trait. So the trait that has been introduced is called as GR golden rice 2E. That was the trait. So this can be grown as good as the conventional rice that we have been growing in our countries. And they have the same yield and agronomic performance as their conventional counterparts. So this is about the golden rice in complete details. So now, BT cotton was given or approved in India to be grown commercially. So let us collect more details about BT cotton. So BT cotton is genetically modified organism or genetically modified pest resistant plant cotton variety, which produces an insecticide to combat ballworm. So this uh, variety of BT cotton is resistant to ballworm. So strains of bacterium, Bacillus thuringiensis produce over 200 different Bt toxins, each harmful to different insects. So this is what is the you know DNA that we actually used is so the bacterium that is Bacillus thuringiensis. So this actually produces 200 different Bt toxins, and these toxins are harmful to different insects. Most notably, Bt toxins are insecticidal to larvae of of moths and butterflies beetles, cotton ball worms and flies, but are, you know, harmless to other forms of life. So they are, uh, you know, harmful to only dangerous, uh, you know, uh, the insects, but they are not harmful to other forms of life. So that is the reason why it has been approved. The gene coding for uh, Bt toxin has been inserted into cotton as trans gene and causing it to produce this natural insecticide in its tissue. So as uh, we know, the it is actually transgenic plant. That means we have in, uh, isolated the gene from some other species and inserted in the you know cotton plant. And in many regions, the main pests in uh, you know commercial cotton are uh, lipidopteran larvae, which are killed by the Bt protein in the genetically modified cotton they eat. So if they eat this genetically modified uh, cotton, they actually die. So that larva is called as lipidopteran larva. So this actually is, you know, spoils the or uh, reduces the yield of the cotton. So this eliminates the need to use large amount of broad spectrum insecticides to kill lipidopteran pests. So obviously when the plant itself is resistant to pests, we need not have to use pesticides to kill such pests. So this spares natural insect predators in the form uh, ecology and further contributes to no insecticide pest management. So obviously this is one of the major issues and major investment actually to go, grow crops, we have to be using a lot of pesticides. So if the plant itself is resistant, then obviously it uh, cuts down a lot of investment on it. So Bt cotton is uh, ineffective against many cotton pests such as uh, plant bugs, stink bugs and aphids. Depending on circumstances, it may be desirable to use insecticides in prevention. So though it is uh, you know, uh, resistant to wide variety of insects, it is also non-resistant to certain uh, you know, insects like uh, plant bugs, stink bugs, and aphids. So in such cases, they may have to use a little quantity of insecticides to kill these kind of insects, which are not resistant to Bt cotton. 
Now let's see the history of BT cotton. Uh, uh, you know, in complete details. So BT cotton was first approved for uh, field trials in the United States in the year 1993, and first approved for commercial use in the United States in the year 1995. So BT cotton was approved by China government in the year 1997. So in 2002, a joint venture between uh, Monsanto and Mahiko introduced BT cotton to India. So in 2011, India grew the largest GM cotton crop at 10.6 million hectares. The US uh, GM cotton crop was 4.0 million hectares and second largest area in the world, followed by China with 3.9 million hectares and Pakistan with 2.6 million hectares. And what are the advantages of uh, this particular BT cotton? So this increases yield of cotton due to effective control of three types of boll worms. Number one, American spotted and pink boll worms. So this BT cotton is actually resistant to all these three different kinds of boll worms. So reduction in insecticide use in cultivation of BT cotton in which boll worms are major pests. And potential reduction in cost of cultivation because uh, the, as I told you, the pesticides are not cheap. They are very expensive and they have to be repeatedly used. So that reduces a lot of uh, you know, cost in the cultivation. No health hazards due to rare use of insecticides. So since we are not using insecticides, obviously insecticide related health hazards can be eliminated. So particularly those who actually engage in spraying of these pet pesticides. So let's uh, know more details about BT cotton in India. So BT cotton is supplied in Maharashtra by the agribiotic company Mahiko, which distributes it. The use of BT cotton in India has grown exponentially since its introdu introduction in 2002. Eight years after the deployment of BT cotton, India became the number one exporter of cotton globally and the second largest cotton producer in the world. So after BT cotton, we became number one exporter of cotton globally and we are second largest producer of cotton. And India has bred BT cotton varieties such as Bikaneri Nerma and hybrids such as NHH44, that is Nanded Hirsutam hybrid. So these are the BT cotton varieties that have been developed by India itself by genetic modification. India's success has been subject to scrutiny. Though it, uh, we have been successful, it is subject to scrutiny Monsanto's seeds are expensive and lose vigor after one generation. Though it has a lot of uh, advantages, it loses uh, vigor. I mean to say, I am talking about Monsanto seeds are very expensive. They lose uh, vigor after one generation, prompting the Indian Council of Agriculture Research to develop a cheaper BT cotton varieties with seeds that could be reused. So it should not, uh, you know, expire within one uh, you know generation then we'll have to do a lot of experimentation once again so it is uh, you know uh, the prompting our uh, own research institute that is indian council of agriculture research to develop cheaper because monsanto seeds are very expensive and they are not you know long lasting so that is why it is high time that we develop cheaper bt cotton where it is with seeds that can be reused we need not experiment again and again so the cotton incorporated the cry one ac gene from the soil bacterium bacillus thuringiensis making the cotton toxic to bollworm so this was the gene actually inserted so this gene is taken from bacillus thuringiensis so this is a soil bacterium this variety showed poor yield was uh, removed within a year and contained a DNA sequence owned by Monsanto promoting an investigation. But this experiment was not successful initially, so it was removed within one year. So in parts of India, cases of acquired resistance against uh, BT co cotton have uh, occurred. So though uh, we saw it was uh, resistant towards a lot of boll worms, but recently there have been reports that these boll worms have developed resistant, uh, resistance against BT cotton. So Monsanto has admitted that pink boll worm is resistant to first generation transgenic BT cotton that expresses the single BT gene. So it has only one uh, gene that is Cry1AC. So out of all boll worms, the pink boll worm has developed resistant to the first generation of transgenic BT cotton as per the reports of Manaswanto. And Punjab Agricultural University has successfully developed the country's first BT cotton varieties. 
ICAR has identified three varieties, namely PAU BT1, F1861, and RS2013 for cultivation in Punjab, Haryana, Rajasthan. It is cheaper alternative to BT cotton hybrid seed. So India, so indigenously, we have also developed three different varieties. So that contribution is by Punjab Agricultural University, and these are found to be cheaper compared to other breeds. Now, what are the major concerns? So though it looks very green and uh, you know advantageous, there are concerns as well. So let us summarize different challenges that we have with respect to you know uh, these. Uh, you know, uh, genetically modified crops. First and foremost is the environmental impact. So let us say <clears throat> we have a kind of genetically modified, uh, you know, crops at the same time, we have uh, same, uh, you know, varieties. Like for example, let's say uh, cotton, which is uh, genetically modified. And let us say uh, cotton, which is not genetically modified. Obviously there will be cross pollination between these two. And the effect of this cross pollination, pollination is not yet studied. So that might definitely impact and cause environmental related issues. So that is the major concern. So cross pollination in GM crops paves the way for herbicide resistant super weeds. So when such cross pollination happens, it might produce weeds that are super resistant that can further threaten the substances of other crops, pests and pests because of its uncontrolled growth. And next is pest resistant BT crops can lead to extinction of few species that in turn can afford affect the food chain also. So as we know that these uh, genetically modified crops are uh, resistant to certain pests and sometimes it might also kill the useful pests. So that is going to actually affect the food chain. So this is a part of our ecosystem. This is going to be disturbed. And uh, number three is uh, implications for consumers and farmers. So National Institute of Agricultural Economics and Policy Research anticipation of scenario that companies might charge premium prices for seeds, in which case farmers may not benefit at all. So as we know, these are special uh, varieties of uh, seeds which actually generate greater uh, advantages to farmers, but the producers of seeds will uh, charge the, them you know exorbitantly so when uh, that is so so farmers may not get the complete benefit of the same next uh, patent laws gives uh, give developers of the gm crops a dangerous degree of control and dominance over the food supply that results in over domination of world food production by a few companies so this uh, patent and IPR is one of the problems. So when such things are uh, you know, given to the developer of these uh, genetically modified crops, they try to actually achieve monopoly. So this actually affects uh, world food production uh, because few companies will actually try to monopolize everything. Next, uh, there are uh, biosafety issues as well. So for example, crops like brinjal and mustard among others have their origin in India. So we have already better uh, you know, natural uh, indigenous uh, origins of uh, these particular brinjal uh, or mustard in India. And introducing genetically modified versions of these crops could be major threat to the vast number of domestic and wild varieties of these crops. So since we already have such crops which are indigenous to us, the introduction of brinjal and mustard, which are genetically modified, it might affect our genes, you know, domestic cultivation. And biodiversity is critical for nutrition and sustainability. And the government's task force on biotechnology 2004 had recommended that no GM crop be allowed in biodiversity rich areas. So no crops should be grown in biodiversity rich areas that has been said by the you know the government's task force on biotechnology in 2014 and next we may have nutritional issues as we saw in case of uh, golden rice the nutritional value may vanish after uh, some time of storing next uh, we have one more example with briti benjol it poses risk to human health as their resistance uh, to antibiotics can turn medicines ineffective and may result in the formation of new toxins and allergens. So since uh, Briti brinjals are uh, resistant to antibiotics and consumption of the same might make uh, human beings also resistant to antibiotics and these antibiotics are used to 
cure so many diseases so if we become resistant to antibiotics you know it becomes very difficult to cure many diseases at the same time it might produce new toxins and allergens as well and toxins produced by gm crops cannot only affect non target organisms but also pose the danger of unintentionally introducing allergens and other anti nutrition factors in food so uh, we might target one particular harmful uh, insect or any agent but it will target non targeted organisms as well so that is going to affect once again with respect to the you know safety of genetically modified crops universally and uh, in efficient regulatory system since these are very new to the world so we have to evolve lot, lot of regulatory systems and no scientific consensus so lack of scientific consensus on safety and efficacy of genetically modified crops and pests have developed resistance to bt cotton as i told you before, before the pink ball worm has uh, developed resistance and that forced farmers to spray lethal uh, pesticides did this led to over 50 deaths by pesticide poisoning in uh, vidarbha in 2017 so these are all the challenges that we have with respect to genetically modified crops so these are the complete details of gm crops how it is grown advantages disadvantages challenges and everything so with this we are concluding this session if you have any questions you can definitely put in comments box thanks for watching namaskara